So the next speaker uh, and the last speaker of this session and of today is uh, Alison Coyle. We'll talk about extended ionized gas is an, in an odd radio circle. Okay. <clears throat> so we're going to talk about something a little different. It's very fun. But first, I want to mention we have a brand new department um, of astronomy and astrophysics at UC San Diego. So we used to be part of a physics department. Now we have our own separate department. So this builds on a long history of astrophysics research at UCSD. We have 12 founding faculty with research spanning cosmology to exoplanets um, in observations, theory, experiment, and instrumentation. And we are hiring multiple new faculty this year, both pre- and post-tenure. Super exciting. The ads will post um, in the next month. We have an existing graduate program, and we have new undergraduate program that's going to start in a year with both um, a Bachelor of Science and a Bachelor of Arts major and a minor. So really exciting. Um, I get to be <laughs> the chair. So I get to create all of the things from nothing. So if anybody has experience and you want to talk to me about what I should or shouldn't do if you were replicating your department from scratch, feel free to come talk to me, because I do not want to reinvent wheels. OK, so we're going to talk about odd radio circles. So in 2021, this is really neat. There was a new class of extragalactic objects discovered. Um, they're called orcs for odd radio circles. There are these extremely large rings of low surface brightness radio continuum emission. They're one arc minute across on the sky. So for all the theorists, that's very large. <laughs> that's huge. Um, they were discovered in ASCAP, which is the Australian SKA Pathfinder. They did a pilot survey of um, several hundred square degrees on the sky at relatively high angular resolution radio continuum emission to very low sensitivity. And they discovered a handful of these in that large area. Then people discovered in archival GMRT data a couple more. So there's about five or six known total currently. Um, some of them have photometrically detected galaxies at the centers that have photoses of around redshift of a half. At that redshift, this size corresponds to a diameter of the radio emission of hundreds of kiloparsecs. OK, so this was the discovery paper showing the ASCAP data. So here's one. Here's another one that maybe has one adjacent and something weird going on. And then here's another one that's a ring. And then that's um, a radio AGN in the center. And then this was the archival. I can't remember if this was the archival data or the, no, this is the, another one than ASCAP that they found again later. So this is the ring of radio emission and then the photometric galaxy at the center. So several have red galaxies at the center, maybe old, maybe dusty. This circular structure implies an energetic event. And there's only a few papers on them, but in the first papers, there was like this whole list of things. Like, it's like, what are these? So is it a supernova remnant, planetary nebula, a galactic wind termination shock, a bent tail radio galaxy, a double lobed radio galaxy that you're seeing based on an Einstein ring? There was even more um, exotic examples in the literature. So multiple potential origins, but unclear what is causing these. So then there was this really neat paper um, in 2022 using follow-up meerkat data on ORC-1, the first ORC that was observed. So this is um, the like ghoulish specter here, is the, is the higher resolution radio continuum data on top of um, optical photometry. And um, at higher resolution, you see this really interesting structure. Maybe there's like overlapping rings at different orientations. Maybe there's some arcs. Um, in the paper, they go through what the possible physical scenarios are here. From this data, they concluded that the radio emission is aged synchrotron emission. And um, in this paper, they compared with a starburst-driven wind model by Cassie Locus from 2018 to say that maybe what this is is a termination shock from a wind, but it has to be a very massive galaxy, a, a stellar mass greater than 10 to the 10, that have very high star formation rate, greater than 300 solar masses per year. So in this paper, they were like, maybe that works, but those galaxies seem pretty unusual. Um, it was this paper that my collaborators and I saw a little over a year ago that got us really excited because we were studying compact, massive starburst galaxies with really high star formation rates that drive 
really large winds. So we were thinking maybe these orcs are a later stage phenomenon of what we were already observing. Um, so here's an example of one of the galaxies that we had been observing. This is Makani. So this is um, KCWI data. This is showing oxygen to emission. This galaxy is at a redshift of around a half. It's very massive, um, 10 to the 11.1. has a high star formation rate, about 150 solar masses per year. Actually has two outflows. This is just showing you the flux in the oxygen too. But you can see there's this um, bipolar outflow that's 100 kiloparsecs across. So the galaxy is right down here at the very, very center. Um, this is a late stage major merger, has these tidal tails. And then this oxygen two nebula is much more extended. And that we think that's an outflow. There's actually two outflows, one smaller and then this larger one. But if you just think about the larger one, anyway, this was why we had been studying these kinds of galaxies and then we saw that meerkat follow up data and we thought maybe it's the same similar process but at different stages. So this was relatively easy to detect with KCWI. This was 40 minutes. So um, what they did was we had observing time on Keck to keep observing those galaxies with KCWI. And one of the orcs in the north, Orc 4, was up that night. So <laughs> I went and looked at it. <laughs> um, and we detected it. So this is the spatially integrated spectrum. Again, this is KCWI, so it's just the blue wavelengths. We see, um, these are zoom-ins, we see a tiny bit of magnesium-2. It's real, I know it doesn't look amazing, but that is real. A tiny bit of neon-3, and then booming oxygen-2. So we were able to get a spectroscopic redshift. Um, this was the first line emission that's been detected from an orc. They've only been detected at radio continuum um, emission. So also we see, we do see, it's not like bright, but we do see a stellar continuum here. So there's a little bit of blue emission, but not very much. We're not seeing evidence for like a broadline optical EGN or anything like that. Um, so it's consistent with a older stellar population. So with our spectroscopic redshift, we then went and fit the SCD of the galaxy at the center, which had been detected in broadband imaging. And we find that it's consistent with a pretty old stellar population. Um, so six giga years plus or minus around two, the error bars are not tiny. Um, and it's very massive, so stellar mass of 10 to the 11.3. So, and we fit, a, we fit it with, with and without a starburst model, and with a starburst model, if there was a burst, we actually get a better fit with the starburst model, but the burst had to be roughly a giga year ago, so there's no ongoing star formation. Okay, so this is um, the, the images from KCWI. So, we did three pointings of KCWI, one centered right at, the orc is huge, <laughs> and we didn't actually have time to observe this. I was stealing time from something else. So what we did was we looked right at the center, and then I did one pointing on either side. We didn't quite get to the scale of the large scale radio emission, but we got most of the way there. We did not detect anything in these two pointings, but we did in the central pointing. So this is the field of view, and then if you zoom into the center, this is the stellar continuum, and this is the oxygen too. So it's very round. This is the ratio of the oxygen to, to the stellar continuum. So this is um, known as the equivalent width. And the equivalent width map is pretty round. The thing that's really interesting is that in the center, the equivalent width gets up to 80 angstroms, which is absurdly high. So there's a whopping amount of oxygen to um, in this thing. So this is the oxygen-2 radial profile, an equivalent with radial profile. So this is a function of radius. This is the surface brightness of O2 and the O2 equivalent width. This is the seeing. This is the stars in the galaxy. So the oxygen-2 is resolved, but it's not as extended as the stars. This is a really big galaxy. Um, this is really interesting. So this is the equivalent width radial profile, and this is the radius scaled to the effective radius of the galaxy because I wanted to compare to the literature. So this is this oxygen-2 equivalent width as a function of scale in other massive early type galaxies. And the, there's not a lot of oxygen-2 in early type galaxies. The oxygen-2 is down here. This is our source. It's like an order of magnitude higher equivalent width and also extends much further out in the galaxy than is commonly seen in O2 and other massive early type galaxies. So there's just this really unusual amount of O2. 
This is the kinematics, so this is the velocity centroid. You know, there's a gradient here. If you take a slice along the center, it's very asymmetric. So when I first saw this, I thought, oh, it's just rotating. But then I realized, oh, no, it's going from minus 30 to plus, like, 150. So it's very asymmetric. This is the velocity width, or sigma map. And then some of the spectra showing this back, individual spaxels. And again, if you take a cross at the center here, this is the velocity dispersion. So it gets very high in the center, about 180 kilometers per second. Okay, so <laughs> I was like, I don't, I don't know what this is. I don't know what I'm looking at. So first I thought, is this just normal oxygen two in ellipticals? Do ellipticals have that much oxygen two? Um, and the answer is no, they don't. The equivalent width is way too high. It's an order of magnitude higher than similar galaxies. And the oxygen two extent is just really large. So that didn't seem right. Um, then we thought this has an unresolved radio point source at the center, which is thought to be a radio AGN. So I thought, okay, maybe there's an AGN there. Maybe it's photoionizing all this gas. Maybe it's causing an outflow, because I work on AGN outflows. But then when we looked at the O2 luminosity versus the radio continuum luminosity and compared to radio AGN, ORC4 is up here. So the O2 is way too bright given the radio continuum luminosity to explain the oxygen 2 as being, from the, being photoionized by the AGN. Also kinematically and morphologically, it doesn't look like an AGN outflow. Okay, so then we realized it has to be shocks because I don't know what else it can be. Um, but we also went and got some long slit GMOS spectra of several of the orcs and actually found um, this orc has liner like line ratios, which is consistent with shock ionization. Okay, so we started thinking well, at least we know what all this O2 is. It's from shocks. Um, but I still didn't know why, like, what's going on. So it was time to bring in uh, the theorists. So maybe there are theorists in the audience who are already like, oh, I know what that is, but I did not know what that was. So um, I reached out to Cassie Locus um, because it was her model that the paper on orcs, the Meerkat paper, compared to her um, starburst-driven wind model to say that maybe the orc is this termination shock of a starburst-driven wind. So I showed her this data, and I was like, could this somehow be related? So she made some new simulations for us. So she has a simulation where she just launches a wind from a galaxy uh, at a velocity of 450 kilometers per second and a pretty high mass outflow rate, 200 solar masses per year. And then it's on for, um, let me this work. Oh, somehow I clicked both of those, sorry. Okay, so on the left, this is the density. In the middle, it's the temperature. Um, and this is the time. So, so this, here, I'll show these again. So the, sorry, I can't, oh, okay, that's not doing what I thought it would do. Anyway, there's the radial velocity. So you've got temperature, density temperature, and radial velocity. So the idea is that you launch this wind at t equals zero, it's on for 200 million years, has this really high mass outflow rate and pretty high velocity, and then after 200 million years, it stops. The, the, what's launching the wind stops. But the, the, terminate, the forward shock keeps going. And if I can make this go again. Oh, that didn't work. Um, sorry, I can't see the cursor on here. But anyway, here's the density. So you've got this forward shock that keeps going, but then there's a, a contact discontinuity and then a reverse shock. And the reverse shock, the shock gas falls back onto the galaxy after the, the starburst wind shuts off. So right around here, you get this cold gas that's falling back onto the galaxy while this forward shock continues. This is a scale here of 200 kiloparsecs. This is a scale of 50 kiloparsecs. So if I can get this to show this one again. So this is the radial velocity relative to the galaxy. It's not the line of sight for the observers. So this is outflowing, the blue, and then the red, the gas is falling back onto the galaxy. Okay, so this is showing the temperature map and the radial velocity map at three different times since the wind started. So this is while the wind is still on. This is um, so two, around 200 million years. This is around 500 million years, and then around 750. So you have this forward shock while the wind is still on, and then this contact discontinuity, and then, and then this reverse shock. Here's temperature. So you've got the cold gas um, behind this reverse shock. 
And then the, after the wind shuts off, this forward shock continues to move out into the halo. This is ab above 100 uh, kiloparsecs at this point. But then this shocked gas falls back towards the galaxy and starts interacting with the gas in and around the galaxy. And then eventually, this corresponds to roughly the time of observations. You have this forward shock that's observed in radio synchrotron emission at 200, more than 200 kiloparsecs. And then this shocked wind, this cold shocked wind gas that's gone back to the galaxy that you observe on scales of like tens of kiloparsecs. Okay, so the idea is that this oxygen-2 is related to the large-scale radio emission. And the same energetic event caused both the large-scale radio ring at a radius of 200 kiloparsecs and this oxygen-2 emission at only 20 kiloparsecs. So starburst or maybe AGN-driven wind drives this forward shock out of the galaxy. Once the wind shuts off, the shocked wind from the reverse shock travels back towards the galaxy as the forward shock continues to move outward to larger radii. So the shocked wind basically falls back to the galaxy because it expands to fill the under-pressurized region, and it creates this turbulent energetic medium with additional shocks interacting with the gas in and around the galaxy. Meanwhile, that forward shock just keeps moving out and creates the synchrotron emission on very large scales. So this is the radius from the galaxy as a function of time since the burst starts. This is the forward shock, and this is the gas that corresponds to the, the reverse shocked gas as it falls back. And so in this model, after 200 million years, the wind, the burst shuts off, and then this gas falls back. So um, we're able to, with this model, reproduce the scales of both the large-scale radio emission and the smaller-scale oxygen, too, um, from the same event. And in this model, the, this forward shock um, has a Mach number of 1.3, and that's consistent with what's required to produce the observed synchrotron emission. Okay, so the features of this wind model are generic features of an energy and mass injection, well, without regard to the source of the injection. So it could be a starburst, could be an AGN, could be some combination. But the key thing is that in order to match the observed oxygen, too, that we see a high mass outflow rate is needed of around 200 solar masses per year, which is pretty high. So this simulation shows that a single event, like a strong starburst, can launch a wind that simultaneously produces this large-scale radio ring and this smaller-scale oxygen, too, when observed roughly a giga year after the initial event, which matches the time scale from the SCD for um, when the, how long it's been since the burst. So this is generally consistent with multiple things that we observe about the oxygen-2 emission. The scale, for sure. Um, the asymmetric velocity gradient, the fact that we see more red-shifted than blue-shifted gas is generally consistent if there's a lot of infall going on. We see this elevated velocity dispersion in the oxygen-2. That would make sense because there should be a lot of turbulence as the gas falls back to the galaxy and there's multiple um, shocks happening. The really high O2 luminosity makes sense because it's from shocks. The line ratios make sense from shocks. It's consistent with the lack of recent star formation in this galaxy. And potentially, even if you have all this like, infalling gas falling back to the galaxy, maybe that could fuel the AGN that is seen as well, the radio AGN. Okay, so for the past um, 15 years now, my collaborators and I have been studying these starburst-driven winds in massive galaxies. So we've been studying these very compact starburst galaxies at redshift of a half. They're late-stage major mergers. They have very high stellar masses, around 10 to the 11 or greater. They're, they have these super compact central starbursts with um, effective radii of like 200 parsecs. They're just tiny. And so they have really high star formation rate surface densities approaching Eddington. These are like Eddington-limited starbursts. They're very extreme. They drive very fast winds, 2,000 kilometers per second or higher, with very high mass outflow rates, greater than 200 solar masses per year. Um, we've estimated their space densities. They're similar to Eulergs and post-starburst galaxies at the same redshift. And with KCWI, we've seen that they can drive these oxygen-2 nebulae with sizes of tens to 100 kiloparsecs. So we think that orcs may be a later stage of a very similar phenomenon. Um, because you need an extreme 
starburst, creating 10 to the 10 solar masses of stars and a very high star formation rate of uh, 300 solar masses per year to create these, but those galaxies do exist. Okay, so to summarize, so the prevailing theory for the origin of orcs is a forward shock from a starburst-driven wind. We've observed extended oxygen, too, in an orc that's consistent with shocked wind from the same energetic event that causes the large-scale radio emission, causing this extended oxygen, too, as the gas falls back and interacts with the gas in and around the galaxy. So in this model of a starburst-driven wind origin for orcs, the ancestors of orcs should resemble these extreme compact starburst galaxies that we've been studying. Thanks. All right, time for questions. Thank you for the nice talk. I learned a lot. Um, you showed beautiful uh, simulations of the shock fronts. Uh, I wonder, is the behavior like the falling back, uh, to what extent it depends on the condition of the um, whatever, the ISM, uh, IGM, the, the medium in this in oh, density? Yeah. yeah, so that's a good question. So I think it, okay, so there's, there are people in the room better suited to answer that question than me. But from my understanding, of, I basically to do this, I had to go read a bunch of papers on stuff I didn't know anything about. But it turns out there are all these papers on even like AGN-driven winds that show this. It's a very generic feature to have this reverse shock. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not super specific on what kind of medium you're going through. It, this has been in the literature for a while. I just never really heard people talk about it before. Everybody was focused on the forward shock, but this reverse shock is really common. So, so and That's my if understanding. I may follow up, so if the reverse shock is true, then you should see like this kind of rings in uh, like different sizes, right? Large, small. Um, well, so the forward shock, you'll see a ring. The re the reverse shock, it's not that it's the wind. Cassie always makes this me say this a very specific because I kept calling it the gas from the reverse shock, and she kept saying no, it's the shocked wind gas. So, anyway, the gas that has been shocked by the reverse shock falls back, but not in a ring. You get that. You could even see in the simulation, you get these like. And this is like not a super high resolution. I mean, if somebody wants to do a hydro code of this, that would be amazing. But even in this model, it's not a ring. You get this, um, it's very turbulent. And you, it, yeah, it, it, it's not a coherent structure when it falls back. And it'll create lots of turbulence and lots more shocks. Like it should get pretty chaotic in the inner region. Hi. Um, so, first, uh, comment on the reverse shock. It actually ceases to ex uh, exist as soon as you turn off the source. So, that's uh, a comment. The second part, can you go back to Cassie's simulations? Yeah. And just uh, read the density for me because I could not see, read the numbers. Uh, what is the density at uh, 100 to 50 kiloparsec? Just yeah, so, out here, it's like 10 to the minus 32. Yeah, so this is a actually serious comment because, you know, this uh, shock propagation does depend on the background density. And given that these galaxies are significantly massive, 10 to minus 32 is way less than what you would have expected. So ideally, if you have a realistic uh, density setup, you would see that these shocks would fade away much sooner and not reach till 200 kiloparsec. So this is actually a serious concern from my part. No, where the reverse shock is, it's much higher. Yeah, so yeah. I can run this. But 100, 100, 250, 200, the density would matter, yeah. Well, so I, I have to go ask. Um, I can't make it stop. Sorry, I made the next one go. Um, I have to go ask Cassie about that because she definitely, we iterated, as I was doing the SED fit and making that better, she kept wanting to know what's the updated stellar mass. We kept iterating. She wanted to make it as close to what was observed um, as she could. So I think she, I mean, I know she took into account the stellar mass of the galaxy and then the halo mass. And sure, that's for gravity, but the density, CGM density actually for these galaxies uh, would be significantly higher. And I did a few simulations and I never find such a strong shock reach, reaching to 200 kiloparsec once you consider proper density in these galaxies. 
Can you send me a follow-up email and I'll follow up with Catherine? I'll, I'll communicate with you. Thank you. Thanks. Very fascinating objects. Um, I was wondering about the O2. You said that it's extended, but the surface balance profile showed that it is in the, sh I mean, looks quite compact to me. It's even compact than the galaxy. Did I mean missing? I just meant more, it's extend, much more extended than the PSF. It's, it's very resolved. It's not more extended than the stars. The galaxy is huge. But compared to other observations of oxygen 2 and massive galaxies, they don't tend to get to this size. Yeah, I was wondering what is the role then of the EGN? I guess you don't have O3, HB, then all the rest yet. No. Um, but um, um, if, if you have such strong O2, uh, in the end, if you have enough gas and enough ionization, you could make it. So I, I thought that maybe it would be more relevant what's happening in the optical rather than the radio. Yeah, so obviously we would love to go back with KCRM and get the longer wavelengths. Um, but from the GMOS long slit spectrum, the line ratios are not EGN-like. They're liner-like. So we think that, at least on these larger scales, it really is shocks, not EGN photoionized. Also, the, the oxygen tube luminosity is like one to two orders of magnitude too high relative to the radio to be explained by just the EGN light. So I, I do think that there, it's, there's a lot of shocks that are causing all of the O2. But we'll try to go back with KCRM, for sure. All right. Any more questions? I don't see any. Do you have any like X-ray observations or plans for X-ray? No, I don't know of any X-ray observations of these. There's only like five of these known in the whole sky. Oh, you have five of these. I thought there was only one. I only have one, okay. but there's five or six known. But I don't think any of them overlap that I've seen in any papers with the deep X-ray field. Okay. All right. Let's thank the speaker again. So uh, now we have the discussion session.